All right, so we're going to start. Um, okay, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody back. We haven't had a meeting for two years and five months due to COVID. So we're, we're delighted to see such a big turnout tonight. And as Eddie was saying, we had a lot of apologies uh, from uh, people who would be here on a larger Um I will um, just introduce the speaker briefly and then I have a few other little uh, matters to, to talk about and then we, we, we have the talk. But um, this is Richard Forrest and uh, he's uh, attached to the Cork City Library and uh, I think he spends most of his time in many fields. Uh, a uh, branch, and he has a big interest in local history, and he's a lot of experience in working in that. A bit like uh, Tim Kennedy and other people who've known Tim, and you know, from working in that department, you know, the people who do that they develop a very good knowledge of local history sources and so on. So he'd be very interesting uh, to. Uh, to listen to, and particularly the topic he's talking about, townlands and parishes. And, um, you know, I suppose when you start doing your genealogy, one of the first things you get used to is the city of the, the townland and how important it is. And how there are something like 64,000 townlands uh, in Ireland. And then the next one up is the parish, which is the next. Um, I suppose administrative division in size, the townland being the smallest, and uh, I think there's about two and a half thousand of those uh, in the country. Um, so, you know, I'd be very interested in hearing some uh, details about townlands and stories about townlands and so on. Um, now, just a reminder that we have a conference planned for uh, March. It's going to, uh, the conference is on, um, I think this is the second of March, is it? Um, and um, it's the title of it is Family Matters. And we have three lecturers that are uh, uh, going to be speaking at it. So we'll obviously be saying more, more about that as, um, as time goes on. Um, now, we haven't been meeting on account of COVID. And uh, the committee got together uh, there recently and we were thinking in terms of how, if we have a similar situation arising again, we could keep the organization going. And I suppose the thing that occurs to everybody is uh, this application called Zoom and a lot of organizations were kind of kept going uh, using Zoom and um, in the course of the last two and a half years a lot of people become, became fairly competent uh, in, in that area and uh, now I was in an Irish language group for a few years we'd meet in Southern Ski on uh, a Thursday from 11 to 12 and then all of a sudden you couldn't meet anymore so we went online and we had our uh, conversations online uh, every Thursday. Now, a lot of the members of this uh, great talker, as it's called, uh, had very little experience of computers, weren't kind of interested, uh, they know how to do email and a few things like that. But Zoom is so easy. Now, for the person who's putting on or starting up the meeting, needs a certain amount of knowledge on it, but you know, not a lot. But anybody who joins us, basically all they need is either um, a, a, a phone, smartphone, uh, or a computer. Now some of our members will be on a smartphone, they get um, an email with a link, all you have to do is press the link, and uh, a whole lot of stuff happens that you don't have to understand with any control over and before you know it uh, there you are you're in the meeting and you can see the other people who are at us you can hear them you can talk yourself and it is just fantastic um, and very very simple so we're in the process now of um, setting up um, a zoom uh, facility 
for the Hartree Magical Society. As I said, um, some of the committee members um, started it off uh, last night and uh, we'll be sending an email out to all the membership and suggesting that maybe, you know, you, you take a particular, we put it on a short meeting just to give you a bit of practice in it and uh, we would kind of start it up. Now, obviously, we like the live meetings, like we say with the Irish group that I mean, it's the live meetings that we enjoy. You can go for a cup of coffee afterwards and so on. But um, occasionally it is very useful to have the uh, other facility. Now, we, we have to acknowledge as well the tremendous work that uh, Eddie did during the last two and a half years. Now, really, the only contact uh, and the only communications that were put out came from Eddie. Uh, and they kept us all in touch with what's going on in genealogy, kept us in touch with sources. Um, now, particularly, we'd say, Eddie sent, sent out on a very regular basis uh, the John Grennan um, uh, article that he has on weekly, and information about all sorts of things. And that was very, very useful. And uh, added to that, then we, we have the Zoom going and we have the regular uh, meetings. And uh, like, it, it is great to see such a big turnout tonight. Um, so uh, I, I think that's uh, all I have to say, unless anybody would like to say anything themselves. And if choose an idea, it's coming on. It's never the best. You make people. Yeah. Know, that's far too for me, you know. Yeah, I, yeah. I agree with that a hundred percent. That uh, you know the online is a substitute, and that, that's basically all that it is. But uh, you know, if we had another situation, we'd say uh, when you take the situation out regarding uh, the cost of gas, the cost of electricity, and maybe halfway through the winter, it will become. Uh, very expensive to open up a hall and to heat it and uh, to light it and uh, maybe it become very expensive to travel because you know the prices of everything are kind of going through the roof. So it might be useful occasionally to have a, a Zoom meeting and I'd recommend everybody to try and kind of get into it and just get uh, maybe um, uh, practice in uh, logging into one little meeting so that if it was necessary for us to have a big long break as we've had, uh, we could actually have a, something going online anyway. Okay, well look, um, um, apologies there to Richard for keeping him <laughs> so long, but um, uh, we we'll just had switch now to proceed with this uh, presentation. Okay, thanks, thanks Tony, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I was with you maybe, maybe a couple of years ago, and I did a talk on the Blarney Parish Records. I, I showed you examples from Blarney Parish Records, they were a good set, a well-kept set of records. Um, so, I'm with Cork City Library, Cork City Library, uh, I was in the Cork County Library. Uh, I did a few years on the local studies desk in the County Library, uh, as Karen, you remember, here has done too. And I transferred to the City Library when the boundary pushed out in 2019, and I did one year in the local studies desk there, in the grand parade in the top floor, but I've been in Mayfield branch uh, since. And I put together this talk for Heritage Week uh, recently, and one or two of you were at that, so I hope you won't be bored too bored today. And so, look, I have a lifelong interest in local history, family history. This is the Park Genealogical Society. I am certainly not a professional. I know John Brennan, but, um, and I'm sure there's people here who know a lot more than I know. But hopefully, uh, it will prove interesting, and you might pick up one or two little pieces as well. And maybe we can exchange some information at the end that I can learn as well. So, the title of the talk is Tom Landon Parish looking at those administrative divisions. And you can see a, a lovely painting there on the front uh, called Townland by uh, Paula Pawley. 
and I suppose it captures the sense of place as almost unmistakable uh, as being Ireland really, isn't it, with the little whitewashed cottages and that. And I suppose townlands and parishes, they're the stage really that our ancestors, particularly but ourselves today to some extent, um, act out our lives, they're like the stage for our lives really. Um, so very briefly, we have, if you, if you go in order, we have counties, barrenies, parishes and townlands. And they, they produce according to size. I mean, very, very quickly, counties, the county and the barony system are essentially imports from England. They, were really, they really came in with the Anglo Normans, uh, who traditionally arrived first in 1169. And their, uh, the county system was modeled on the Shire system that, that developed in England, the Shire system. Um, by the 1200s, you had Dublin, you had Cork, Kerry. Oriel, which would correspond to Lowood, Tipperary and Waterford. They were all what you call established shires. Okay. And uh, following on from that then, you had um, Mead coming into existence in the, in the 13th century, and uh, Ulster and Connacht forming slowly. And a milestone in the 1540s was the, was the plantations which formed Queen's County and King's County in the Midlands. Um, and then Connacht was, was split into its counties in 1579 and Ulster followed, uh, particularly under Sir John Perrow, who was the Lord Deputy of Ireland. He delineated the counties there in 1585. And some years later then, 21 years later, 1606, Wicklow was finally established, its boundaries were set, and 1606 you had the 32 counties of Ireland formed. You could say it almost took 400 years as a ballpark figure that they came into formation. Um, so hand in hand in with the county development was the grand jury system. The grand juries were the system of local government, if you like, for centuries and centuries. Um, you had the king's officers, you had what was called the Shire Reeve, who uh, took into account justice in the counties, the administration uh, of, from the king ultimately. And the Shire Reeve would give us the word sheriff. That's how that would have evolved, sheriff. So the grand jury was sort of the local government system of its time. Um, itinerant justices, they would travel around each county doing legal hearings, etc. Um, the grand juries then lost a lot of their uh, authority, if you like, in 1838 by the establishment of the boards of guardians. The boards of guardians. They were primarily responsible for county management, uh, the Boards of Guardians. And then, 60 years later, 1898, you had um, the Local Government Act of 1898, and that set up the local authorities largely as we know them today um, county councils, city councils. So, 1898, when they came about, and that transformed county administration. You, you were looking at things like uh, local taxation roads, uh, census figures, uh, think all those kind of things based on a local uh, administration. Now, there was, um, by 1606 the county system was set, but there was they got tweaking, for example, English Buffin Island, that once belonged to Mayo, and was given over to Galway, there was a few little minor tweakings like that, but was essentially set by 1606. And I suppose it's ironic in a way that the county system is so important to the GEA, it being kind of an English importation, if you like. Um, it's very much caught up in GEA passions um, and uh, our own identity. We identify as a Cork person, or as a Kerry person, or as a Donegal person. And it's very much based on an English system that came with the Anglo Normans. So I suppose um, you could say Cork and Kerry are you know, quite similar geographically, they're close. People maybe are more similar than maybe southern people and northern people, but there's still differences. So for example, um, if a court man says, I will, yeah, well he means no. You know, a Donegal person might not quite click with that, but a Kerry person would. So if Jim was living in this school for the last 40 years, and his neighbour said, well, I suppose now Jim, you're here 40 years, so you'll show for Kerry. The court man would say, I will, yeah, and the Kerry man will know what he means. Um, Cork, of 
course, it was the biggest county, and uh, it must have taken a lot of, a lot of traveling around on horseback if you were one of the king's officers or one of the king's justices. And there was a proposal in 1614 to split Cork in two. So what they were proposing was to take the mouth of the Ulanui River, which is in Carrigan Island, and bring a line westwards, and you'd have had two counties either side of that. But uh, that never happened, obviously. And so we all know 32 counties. Now, if we move on to Baronies, Baronies were also an Anglo Norman importation. They were brought in by the Anglo Normans. So, again, a sort of an English imposition on the country, if you like. And it's connected to the jurisdiction of a baron, you know. So, you have the, you have the Anglo Norman lords who were responsible for the, the governing of a barony. So, say the barony of Barrymore in East Cork. That's intimately connected with the Barry family. They were the lords of Barry Moore. There's 23 uh, making up the county. The 23, there's 23. And um, nationally, the baronies tend to be smaller in size in the east of the country. Uh, as you move west, they grow bigger. They're bigger in size. So a do hello would be more typical of the west of the country there. Um, so you can see, for, uh, let's see, you know, you can see kind of Anglo-Norman names, if you like, like a uh, like Barrett there in the middle, uh, Corsi, uh, Barry Row, and uh, and Barry Moore, the Barry families. So you can see, you can, and of course, uh, the McCarthy, the Gaelic family, if you like, with Musgrave. But you can see River, or Lina, you can see names in some of those baronies. Some of them are very poetic. Some of the ones bordering Cork. Uh, from Tipperary and Waterford, we've Cushmore and Cushbride, DCs within Drum, and almost a Lord of the Rings type barony, Ifa and Offa, so it's like something from Tolkien. So nice poetic names, whatever their origins are. Um, mapping is intimately connected with Tomlands, parishes, baronies, counties, and one of the most major surveys was in the 1600s. It was the Down Survey led by Sir William Petty, and the country, most of the country, not a lot of Connacht, was mapped from 1656-1658, and beautiful colour maps, and there you can see the barony of Muscovy depicted in the Down Survey. And a lot of that, of course, was connected with land possession. 1600s, the Gaelic Order was passing, if not already passed, and uh, English control was strengthening, map making was a way of laying out the territory that uh, was up for possession, and um, that's really what a lot of map making is concerned with, especially that far back. Who owns what? Land has always been to do with power. The more land you owned, the more powerful you were, that kind of thing. Nowadays it's a bit different. We could have a nice house, plant anywhere really. Once we have the house, the car, and broadband were flying. You know, but long ago, it was really the, the, the soil and the stones and the earth and the, that, that you needed your hands on to, to get by. In, 16, in 1836, uh, the grand juries um, were enabled by an act of parliament to divide large families, again, to ease administration. Um, and to unite small baronies. So at that point, they divided Carberry, they divided Muscovy. You can you can see there how they're divided. Um, and Condens and Clangibbon, Arley and Kilmore, they would have been separate baronies originally, and Gibbon and Barry Gold. So that was for the purposes of administration. Um, but it did lead to the confusing situation where you now have four Carberries, if you like. Carbon East, Western Division, Carbon East, Eastern Division, Carbon West, Western Division, Carbon West, Eastern Division. If you didn't know which one you lived in, you'd, you could be forgiven, I suppose. <laughs> uh, I should point out that the Baronies really, they functioned like mini counties. There was, there was no great difference between counties and Baronies. They were involved, they were concerned with local administration. Um, so tax might be collected on a Barony basis, it might be collected on a county basis. The county cess, the barony cess, it would be going towards things like road maintenance and that. So you could possibly argue that a few hundred years ago, if you were travelling between Musgrave and Barrett's, you might suddenly notice a difference in how the road was kept, much as if you were entering a different county now, 
you'll often see a different type of Karamek or something like that. So they were sort of mini counties, that's the way they worked. And of course, the Local Government Act of 1898, that really consigned Baradis to the dustbin of history. They, they really were effectively finished. They still had a bit of legal standing, but they were effectively done. Now, they, they would live on, of course, in, in common language, in songs, like the Bowl Tady Quill. There'd be a bit of baronial pride there. Um, and also something like hotel names, you can see there. You know, athletic clubs, uh, Mahmoud and Firma, they use several barony names for their divisions within Cork. So there is that still, that existence still. Um, the historian C.J.F. McCarthy, I don't know if some of you remember him or not, but uh, I don't remember him now, but when I heard that one time he was asked, what was the purpose of a baronial high constable? That was one of the baronial, baronial administrative officials. And he said, well, by 1898, when the Local Government Act came in, it was essentially to go to the funerals of other baronial high constables. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there you have a list of the baronies in the 1881 census. It's showing you that um, you know, they, they were used for census returns as well. And there you have the list of the baronial high constables in 1898 from Guy's directory. And, you know, you can see that the names of the great and the good at the time, some of them indeed are living within their baronies, and others are, like you can see, Thomas G. Hart, or Hare, he's down in Queenstown, he's the baronial high constable for, for uh, Duhano. So as I say, 1898, they were effectively finished. Now, on to parish. We want to talk about parishes and town lands. That's what we're going to do. Now, the parish and the town land they differ in that they're of greater antiquity. They're of greater antiquity than the county or, or the barony. They're old. Okay? And they existed before the arrivals of the Anglo Normans. They were, they were in place, they were up and running at that time before the Anglo Normans arrived. And the Anglo Normans didn't do a whole lot to alter them as they were when they found them. They did um, sometimes rededicate churches to saints. The kind of the pan European trend of naming a church after St. John or St. Mary or, or St. Nicholas, etc. So there was a bit of that renaming went on. Now, the word parish is said to stem from the Greek paroikia. Paroikia. Oh, I don't know who studied Greek in school, but if you did, forgive my pronunciation. But paroikia. And it would literally be come from para, meaning near, like a paramedic. Para, and oikia, which would mean neighbour. So it would literally mean near neighbour. And again, again, you get a sense of the landscape that your neighbours are important. You depend on them, they depend on you. You're living in the landscape. You can't just go on to your broadband and order the groceries from Tesco, that kind of thing. So paroikia, that's where it would come from. And it would have the very important divi uh, distinction compared to the other divisions of being intimately connected with the church. Okay, it was an ecclesiastical division. The clergyman of the parish was responsible for the care of his flock. <laughs> um, now the Reformation, as you know, it didn't really find very fertile ground in Ireland, but it still had a massive impact on Ireland. And it impacted the parish system greatly. It led to a split in the parish system, okay, which we'll talk about in a moment. Essentially, the you want to call them, I suppose, the New English, the New English Protestant arrivals after the Reformation, they really kind of uh, requisitioned the ancient parish system that had existed for so long, and they based their own church upon it, but also civil administration, civil government, the ordinary government of the day. So the, the, the old parish system was taken over by the English arrivals, and they used it for their church, and they used it for the civil administration of Ireland. Okay? So then you have what you call old parishes or civil parishes. And then the Catholic Church started something different, which we'll refer to in a moment. Okay, so the two parish systems. Now we talked about the Down Survey, and in addition to the baronies, the parishes at the time were mapped. So lovely colour maps, and you can see how Alabolog was depicted there. 
and um, you may even recognise some of the town land names which are in there. There's Leeds and there's Kilbert and there's Clanmoyle. You can see those. And then you can see the word mountain and often you'll see the word bog because the town lands, they're, they're, they're a work in progress. It's not the case that there was no town lands or parishes one day and the next day they were all laid out. Okay? Certainly they're very ancient, but they evolve. And some of the names we can recognize are there in the 1600s. Um, so that's the that's from the down sort of it. Um, so civil administration, okay, census taking is an example, and, and a good um, census example, which is of interest for family history, is the census of 1766. That was when the Church of Ireland clergymen, they were asked to count up the people in their parishes and declare which were Protestant, which were Catholic. Okay, that was a sense of 76. <coughs> I think it may be going on now, I think they might be trying to hammer it all together, I saw that recently. Um, 1766. So, um, for example, the parish of Carrigohan, Carrigohan Bay. Carrigal and Bay would be a small civil parish out there near Lee Mount Cross, beyond the Angler's List. There's a filling station there, do you know that filling station? <laughs> and the graveyard of that small little civil parish uh, would be behind that uh, filling station. That would be Carrigal Hand Bay. Carrigal Hand Inn would have taken in Melancholy in a much bigger area. So the clergyman for Carrigal Hand Bay in 1766, he counted up the inhabitants, he said which were Catholic, which were Protestant, he gave the name of the head of the household and he did them townland by townland. He was quite thorough. Others just gave a ballpark figure for Catholic inhabitants, gave the Protestant names and didn't distinguish which townland they lived in. And John Pratt, he gave Cooley Duff um, 67 inhabitants in April 1766. So that's an example of using the parishes for administrative purposes. And so another purpose would have been the, the tide collection, which would have been a taxation, a taxation to support the Church of Ireland clergy. You're, you're all probably aware of that. And in the tide department books, you'll see names given that you won't readily recognize because they're old parish names that would have failed of common use and the Catholic Church won't have kept them on. So here are the extracts from the tide books. You can see Temple Bowden, and you can see the parish of Tullidis there, and uh, Kilshanik. So some of them are familiar, others won't be. For example, not Temple, that would cover the Fremont area in North Cork. Not Temple would be the old civil parish name. So again, you can see the Church of Ireland state using um, the old parish system. Um, the Church of Ireland really kind of almost functioned as an arm of government. The, the clergy were almost like civil servants, really as well as their religious ecclesiastical function and they used the parish system. Um, the other big mapping project of course was the Arden Survey which was done between 1829 and 1842 and the remit of the Arden Surveyors really was to map the country townland by townland, parish by parish, barony by barony. That was the remit and the purpose was again for administration for things like taxation, etc. And um, I'm sure you've all looked at OSI.ie, those maps are freely available on OSI.ie, and the down survey ones, by the way, are also available through Trinity College's website. So these down survey maps can be looked at online for free also. Um, there's close to 200 years between them, of course. The first urban survey, as I said, was pre famine, 1829 to 1842. And you can see a very neat uh, illustration of the boundaries there in relation to Bandon, Bandon Town, and the Bandon River. So the red lines are the townland boundaries. So you essentially have four different townlands there. The green line, north of the river, is the parish boundary. So south, you'll have Benny Moden, that would be the old parish name, and north, you'll have Kilbrogan. And Kilbrogan might be familiar to you because Kilbrogan Hill is kind of well known. And the yellow then is the barony boundary. You won't see so many of those on the Arctic Circle maps. 
and the Ordnance Survey was done six inches to a mile, it was a fantastic scale, and every building is depicted on it at the time, they say, and the accuracy is still marked on that, if you superimpose a photographic, uh, photographic work from today, aerial photography, over the original maps, and they match up very, very closely, it was very little discrepancy, and it's extraordinary really, when you think that even the common bicycle had scarcely been invented when the surveyors got to work. It was extraordinary. There's, there's great reading on that. There's a lot of books out there that will tell you more about the that thing. And uh, just fantastic what they achieved. Um, uh, I came across a 19th century recruitment poster for the Ordnance Survey. It kind of breaks up all the expectations we have today of equal opportunities and fair working conditions. Well, I'll just read it out to you because it's, it's very interesting. I mean, the country really was back almost step by step, you know. Um, the successful candidate will be expected to endure travel in lodgings. You can just imagine that, though, some damp turf fire and rain coming into a straw roof, maybe. And um, also heat and cold, so we'll be working on all kinds of weather. Um, and the boundary divisions that look in. They will also be expected to be men of activity that can leap, ditch, and hedge, and furthermore, can rustle with the several rude persons with whom they might expect to be crossed and opposed. <laughs> so we don't want you to turn lens and somebody spots you and they're wondering what the heck you're doing there, so they might have to rustle with them. <laughs> so that was an ad from the time. Now the civil parish system, which we've been talking about, the old parishes which are depicted on the Ordnance Survey, Barry Owen, Kilbrogan, and really to make progress in family history, you need to have a good awareness of the distinction between the Catholic parishes and the civil parishes. The, the distinction between the two. And I suppose basically, Catholic emancipation in 1829, largely achieved by Daniel O'Connell, that kick-started the Catholic Church into the redesigning its own parish structure. It, it was a liberated church. It would come out of the closet, if you like. Um, churches started to be built. Uh, the old mass rocks were a thing in the past. And the Catholic administration began to redesign its parish structure nice and openly and freely. And it was reflecting uh, changes that had happened in the interval during the penal days, if you like. So I suppose. Um, Maybe a, a simple illustration of the changes that would be made. Okay? Here you have from the National Library's website, you have a depiction of Catholic parishes in Cork. Right? In a scar that is highlighted, but just move to the right to Blarney. Okay? Now, the two old civil parishes that composed that area, Blarney, were White Church in the north, which you've probably heard of, and Gary Klein in the southern part. Okay? So, the way Blair is depicted there is a composition of two civil parishes, two old parishes, White Church and Garrickon. And basically, the boundary between those two old parishes was lifted out and it became one larger new parish. And the outline boundary is the same as the old parishes had. You see? So, those were the kind of changes that were made. Why were those changes made by the Catholic Church in that specific example? Well, if you went back to the 1600s, say, when the down survey was done, there really wasn't a village or a town in Blarney. Might have been a few more cabins near the castle, Blarney Castle, along the McCarthy's. But in the interval, during the penal days, around the 1760s, the Jeffreys family, which had replaced the McCarthy's, they began an industrial village. Right? So they started a mill village, and Blarney began to grow as, as a, as a centre, an urban centre. Um, so that gave it significance. Uh, when the Catholic Church came to redesign its parish, it took that into account and renamed the new parish Blarney. Okay? So that's how that came about. Now, Blarney Castle is in a townland called Blarney, but the village actually grew up in the next townland called Monaconetta. So you can say that Blarney is not in Blarney, <laughs> because it's not in the townland. So those are the little intricacies pop up time and time again with uh, parishes and townlands, but you know, they, they add to the interest of it really. Now our next slide 
is the title page of the parish uh, records book uh, from Blarney, and you can see it dates to 1778, long before 1829, the Catholic Emancipation. And it reflects, it's in Latin, but it reflects the older system that, uh, that uh, the Blarney Parish hadn't been formed yet. So it's Reverend James uh, Gleason, pastor of White Church and Gary Klein. So you can see the two individual parishes are stated, but he's overseeing the two of them. And then post-1829, they become one as Blarney. All right. Now, a, a, an interesting feature about the parishes and townlands is that they predate Baronies and counties, and uh, for that reason, you know, Catholic parish, well, Catholic parishes, they stay within the county boundaries. They respect the county boundaries uh, because the counties uh, were you know, up and running by the time the Catholic parishes were brought up. But the old parishes, they predate the counties so they sometimes overlap between counties. So an example of that would be, say, Drushan, uh, down around Mill Street. Drushan is the old parish name, and that stretches over the boundary into Kerry. Um, another example would be Lismore and McCullough, which would stretch between Waterford and Cork. Okay? That shows that the, that the parish, those old parish boundaries are older than county boundaries. Um, the civil parishes, they tend to be smaller in size, and there's 249 of them all together, 249. And in fact, eight of them consist of just a single townland, the civil parishes in County Cork. Of the 249, eight are just a single townland. And here's a very interesting one in the Orbit Survey. It's, it's called Kilbrogan. It's a parish and a townland of 231 acres. And uh, you can see it's got a green boundary and a red boundary, and that indicates that. And look how it matches the physical landscape of today. It still adheres very closely to it. Did it ever have a church on it? I suppose there was some little religious establishment in today on it, but there's no indication even on the map of 1840. Now at the other extreme, you've killed Mokamog, which would cover Bantry and surrounds down there. And that, and Glengariff, and that comes up to 206 townlands. So from Kilgrogan, one townland parish, you have a 206 townland parish called Kilmukamog, which would cover Bantry and Glengariff. Uh, Clanfert, that would be covering Newmarket and Entorp. That would be another very big civil parish in North, <coughs> in North Park. And of course, then you mustn't confuse it with Clanfert, Clan, uh, Clanfert which is a diocese in Galway. Um, the names can be confusing. For example, if I asked you, can you be in Donegal and Clanbell at the same time? <laughs> you would say, like, what's you talking about? Did you ever do geography in school? But well, in fact, you can. <laughs> you can be in Clanbell and Donegal at the same time without ever leaving Park. All right, and this map will show you. Because down on Great Island, one of the civil parishes forming Great Island is Clanbell. You can see the CLO there. That's the same parish name. And down below it, in fainter writing, uh, or, or sorry, up above it, you can see uh, Donegal. You can see Donegal Townland. There it's written across the screen there. So that's a townland in the civil parish of Clanbell. <laughs> I'm great on it. Now, so we're familiar with some of the names, like White Church, that might be familiar to you guys there, because the name is still used, but so many have fallen out of use, so many of the old parish names, that we mentioned a few while ago. Other ones you'll be familiar with, because the graveyard attached to the civil parish lives on, part of the point lives on. So people will be aware of names like uh, Dunburg, Garrettine, as I mentioned, Curric upon uh, Rathcoonie, they all have the graveyards and they're the one part of the graveyards. But of course they were civil parishes one time around those graveyards. For comparison's sake, and if you look at England, it's the townland that was, oh, sorry, the parish that was considered the smallest unit. Uh, whereas here it's the townland. The, the parish was the smallest administrative unit, and a step up from that was what was called the hundred. The hundred. And the hundred is a great antiquity as well. It could be 
place on an area of land that could support a hundred families, or else an area of land that could recruit a hundred men for military purposes. So that's what they, they would have in England. And that's a concept that would exist in other countries too, other European countries, and even as far away as Japan and China, they have had a similar system, recruiting military, military might, if you like. And um, somebody was telling me there recently that in the 1970s, the Dunmore Carnival, Dunmore, that they had a carnival, a very successful carnival, and the rivalry between the townlands in the tug of war was something fierce. <laughs> so you'd have the likes of Fornut and Fairmount, and they'd be putting the life out of the rope. And it, is almost, it almost sort of reminds you of uh, the idea of the hundred, of recruiting strength from within a territorial unit. Um, some of the civil parishes are peculiar in that they have islands. Let's see now. So, some examples of the islands would be St. Anne's Shandon. St. Anne's Shandon has a little island out near Rakuba, Cooney, and Kilcully. And Kilbarry, that's a civil parish near the Croon, it has an isolated part of Ballandee Parish. Um, uh, sorry, Kilbarry. Yeah, it is, uh, it is near McCroom, but it's actually an isolated part of Ballandine Parish, which is down near Bandon. And here on the screen, you have the parish of St. Nicholas's, which would cover part of the south side of the city, stretching out. St. Finn Parish will cover the other part of the south side. And St. Nicholas's had a little island away out there um, near Ovens. Near Ovens or Kilomundi. And what was the reason for that? Look, maybe it was to do with offices and the income from offices, of course. Income is always important. And in the case of St. Nicholas's and Valenity, the rectors of those two parishes, they were the chancellor and the treasurer of the combined diocese of Cork, Klein and Mass, and as such they enjoyed certain benefices. So possibly to do with income, maybe. And parish names. Well, they have an ecclesiastical significance usually. So you have three examples there. Um, desert and Donna, sorry, four examples, Kill and Temple with some actual civil parishes within uh, Cork. And desert would, could relate to an isolated place where a holy man lived, that would be ecclesiastical significance, or else it might be named in, in a tribute to a, to a hermit. And Cork is supposed to have more deserts um, than any other county in Ireland, <laughs> which is probably suitable after the recent weather. And Dunham or Donuk is supposed to be a very, very old prefix to a parish name. It's supposed to be an early borrowing from the Latin uh, Dominicum, meaning a church, um, relating specifically to a church as a physical building. So you have the idea of German for cathedral as dome that might fit in there, with the dome of St. Peter's, of course, in, in uh, Rome. And uh, its falling out of use was reckoned to be very early, as early as the 8th century, uh, Dunham was supposed to have fallen out of use as a famous name. So that would indicate that anything with Dunham or Dunham in it is very, very ancient. And Kill, Kill is up there with Valley as one of the most common prefixes in Irish famous names. Kid. And almost a quarter of Cork's civil parishes, 249 of them altogether, they begin with kill. And kill would derive from Latin also, the Latin kella or sella, C E L L A, um, indicating um, like a temple, a temple, a holy site, like a temple, um, but all, like a rectangular windowless room in Roman times. Kella, where, where devotion to a god or a saint was conducted. So the idea of a cellar in a house, or a cell, like a prison cell or a monk's cell, they would all have the same derivation um, as kill in, in, our, in our parish place names, signify the place of uh, prayer or worship. Um, now sometimes kill is uh, confused with quill, meaning a wood, so sometimes when a townland name is starts with kill, it actually would be a mistransliteration for for quill, meaning a wood. 
rather than the church or holy place. So an example of that would be Kilcrenna, which is out near Healy's Bridge beyond Banakani. Uh, Kilcrenna wouldn't signify a holy place as such, it's more likely to uh, indicate a wood. Um, temple or temple, we mentioned that there as well in our list, uh, with some examples there. That again would be a Latin borrowing, templum, signifying church. And generally, a saint's name after it. You can see that there are those examples, like Temple Greedy, Donald Trump that would be St. Bridget, and that's a very notable church woman, I suppose, that would be a familiar with it, Donald Trump So, if we move back to the town land, the town land is now the smallest unit of administration, okay? The smallest land unit. And all the other divisions that we were mentioning, like parishes, and counties and baronies, they are simply collections of townlands. They are a collection of townlands. They are in the building blocks. And County Cork is made up of 5,429 townlands. So almost 5,500 individual townlands made up County Cork. Again, very ancient, like our parishes. They <coughs> rarely transgress uh, boundaries. Very rarely they transgress boundaries. They stay within the old parish boundaries. And there's been different terms to indicate what we think to be a townland now. Um, Belly Bay Tuck, Cartron, Grieve, Tate, Quarter, Plowland. They all have been used in documentation over the centuries. Um, probably the most common next to townland would be the last two, Quarter and Plowland. Uh, Belly Bay Tuck is interesting. The, the bia, bia in the middle would indicate bia, food. So again, by like raising enough food to support X amount of people. And the uh, quarter, that would sometimes figure in Tonglen names, like Karu. There's a Karu in white church as it happens, and Karu, C-A-R-H-O-O, -O, that would literally be the Irish quarter, a place, a section. Now, um, you know, as I was mentioning when well, oh, none of these divisions are written in stone. You know, they, they evolve, they change over time, and uh, that's happening to this day. Um, the Ordnance Survey certainly sort of uh, set the boundaries very firmly, um, but they, they are a process of evolution. Like by the 17th century, um, some of the comments that we know today uh, were established, but plenty were not. They took time. A work in progress. But how was a townland formulated? Like how did it decide that look this is going to be a townland? Well, it's reckoned that if six horses were plowing, okay, six horses were plowing for 48 days, um, the ground that they would cover would amount to a townland. Okay, the six horses were called a shestrock, shestrock. And um, 48 days was likely to be the amount of time in the year that were good for plowing. Okay, so that's, that's supposed to be, that's the theory behind it. Now you might think then, well, wouldn't they all be the same size, the same amount of horses doing the same amount of plowing? Well, of course, the nature of the land would dictate a lot. <coughs> so a large town land may, may often be poorer quality land, or historically it might be poorer quality land, but it be plain since, of course. And smaller townlands are often good quality land, better quality land. Okay, so that's the that's the, the, the thinking behind it. Um, and the link with the Shashrock is is evidence in some place names. So, for example, here you have a townland called Farinasheshri, Farinasheshri, which literally means plowland. You see, Farin is the land, and Shashrock, Shashri, that's in the second part of the name. And that's down there on the Bandon River. And I have the three map examples up there. You have the Down Survey from the 1600s, the Ordnance Survey from the 1800s, and a more or less contemporary photographic uh, from the air. And you can see how similar they are, especially of course the river, that really uh, is like a permanent boundary. But as we know, rivers shift and change as well. So, Farina Sheshwari, uh, so that gives you the Sheshwari in that. 
And then along the function river, the function uh, is Farran Law Shashri, Farran Law Shashri, which will be the, the half flow land, Lap or Law uh, Shashri. The very, very smallest stone land, just a piece of useless information, the very smallest stone land in the whole of the 32 counties is reckoned to be one in County Antrim called Mill Tenement. And Mill Tenement is one acre, one road, and one perch. <laughs> they were your measuring, your, your measuring system, of course. Perch would have been from Pertica for a pole, literally measuring the ground out pole by pole. So, acres, roads, and perches, mid tenement, an acre, a road, and a perch. On the other end of the scale, then, you have to go west, which you might expect. You have to go way out to Melo to Sheshkin. And Sheshkin, there will be more than one of those in the country, of course, but this particular Sheshkin is 7,012 acres. So, you could say 7,000 times the size of the smallest town land. So if your ancestors were from Mill Tenement, you might have much trouble. It's a small enough place to walk around. But if they were from Sheshkin and County Mayo, you might have 7,000 acres to, to traipse to find the ancestral farm. And now names can be deceiving. In East Cork, there's a town land called 40 acres. And then the Ordnance Survey shows us that it's 51 acres, 3 routes and 33 purchase. So possibly a different way of measuring all the acres. Possibly the town land was extended before it was mapped by the Ordnance Surveyors. Um, a very small town land in County Cork, I'll put it up there for you, not much, not much bigger than the one in Antrim, is called Troopers Close. That's down in Kinsale, and it's one acre and three roads. That's what that is. Oh, sorry, it's nine acres, nine acres and three roads. And I mean, it is all very evident. Troopers Close, there you have an ordnance ground in the middle, it is a military establishment. Infantry barracks written up there, plain and simple. So, do you know, is it an ancient town land? Who knows? Um, now, when I was on the local studies desk in the county, um, I had never heard of the, the town land of Old Castletown. That's at the other extreme, which is 864 acres, old Castletown. I've never heard of it at all, but it came across our desk twice in the one day. And the first one was an email. It was an email from Australia. There's old Castletown on the right, the north, the northwest, I'm sorry, the northeast side of Kildare village. It's 864 acres. And anyway, we got an email, and this lady in Australia, she was asking, could we find out anything at all about her ancestor, who was called Morris Healy, and who had come to Australia in 1825? He had been transported over there, and she wanted to see if we could learn anything. Well, this was the first time I ever heard about Castletown. Um, I, I looked up the Ordnance Survey, I found out where it was. There it was at Kildarity, and it contained the Fair Green. I then went to the early Park newspapers, and in the copy of the Southern Reporter for 1825, Little piece. And it said that Morris Healy and others were leaving the fair of Kildare or Castletown when they got involved in a fracas. Some kind of fracas happened along the road and it resulted in the death of an individual. You know, maybe the head hit the ground, maybe a stone hit his head, whatever. It, it resulted in his death and Morris Healy was transported for life. So I was able to get back to her about that. It was a center of a little piece. And uh, she said to me, well, do you know what the ironic thing is? Morris Healy became a policeman in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I suppose that was a good outcome for him. Now, it's very interesting that the little report from 1825, almost 200 years ago, it said that he died, or that this man died along the road after leaving the fair in Old Castletown. So, there's two roads, crossroads at Kildare, so he died literally on one of those roads there. Um, the second mention then was when I was stowing away the current day's newspapers at the end of the day, I had a quick road through the echo, what jumps out of me on the old castle town, somebody was up to the port for setting fire to a JCD. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I learned about it twice in the one day. Now, when you see roads as townland boundaries, because the red lines, as you know now, are the townland boundaries. And um, this is a sign that there are very old roads. Very, very old roads indeed, most likely. What other boundaries can we talk about in relation to townlands? Well, natural features. 
definitely rivers we saw in some of the examples, and the ridges of hills, tops of hills as they run along. They would be other good um, examples of natural boundaries. But then there are also man-made ones. If a hedge or a field division is a town and boundary, then it is a very, very old uh, field division. And the older hedges, the more species it will have in it. And often the thicker it will be, much better for wildlife. You know, it takes an awful, awful long time for a hedge to acquire X amount of species in it. Uh, so, old hedges. Um, so the man-made ones and ditches and things like that. So in the next slide you'll see a very kind of stark example of a man-made town and boundary. It is Castle Lopert in, in North Park. And again you can see the important survey map and you can see contemporary aerial photography. And basically it was the laying out of an estate in octagonal form. And that became a town and in its own right. You can see by the red lines there. I showed that to my colleague, and he's not, he's, he's, he's not far from there where he's living, and he said, my goodness, I never heard of my life. I'm going to trace over the fields and have a look at that. You mightn't see much of ground level, of course. The air reveals a lot. Now, we're getting through with that, so I won't keep you too long, hopefully. But I'd like to refer to um, an English academic called Oliver Rackham. And Oliver Rackham wrote a book some time ago called A History of the Countryside. It relates mainly to Britain, but he does make a good reference to Ireland as well. And Oliver Rackham discusses at length the way boundaries would have been formed in England back in Anglo-Saxon times. And he studied the, the Domesday Book and the Anglo-Saxon charters before it. And he felt that, like here, the boundaries are very ancient and most of them established before the Anglo-Normans came into England as they probably were here as well, many of them. And he says that many of the boundaries over there would literally correspond to an Anglo-Saxon perambulation, meaning a walk. You know, like, like, like the farmer walking the bones, walking his bones on his farm. So a few Anglo-Saxons would get out, they'd go for a walk, and they would devise the boundaries for the community. And it might correspond to something that would be there then, like the Roman state or an Iron Age fort, but uh, that's the continuity, of course. All these things are a process of continuity. And he said that once the boundaries were set in Anglo-Saxon times, they changed very little. And the Normans might have pushed one out and made a deer park, something like that. But until World War II, uh, really, the system was almost frozen. And after World War II, then, it just, you know, it was so much removed, so much hedging removed, so many features removed. And I suppose similar happened here. And um, Rackham says that trees account for 7% of uh, boundary markers that trees do. And thorn trees particularly were, were picked out as boundary markers, but they rarely appear in English place names. And he reckons the reason for that is that thorn trees were distinctive in the countryside. Like when you see a hawthorn thorn tree, it does stand out with its red berries or its white flowers. Um, but they were so common that they weren't considered kind of quality enough for a place name. And going through the trees, oak gets primary filling in the place name, ash, crabapple, willow, alder. That's what they feature in the English place names in popularity. But thorn trees were used as markers. Um, so it gives us from an example of the laying out of a boundary. And it dates from the year 980, 980 in Hampshire. It's in an Anglo-Saxon chapter. It says, to the two oaks that stand into the road, then along the hedge to the east of Lamphurst, to the ivy tod, to the stock that the swing gate used to hang on, from the stock out through the middle of Hill B, to the old ash, from the ash south over the road to the apple tree, from the apple tree to the white hazel, along the hedge row and out to Lindbergh. And there you had um, an entity delineated in 980. And I think it's probably safe to presume that our own townlands were devised with similar reference to natural features like that. Um, roads and paths, they make up 10% of English boundary markers in the Anglo-Saxon characters. And fords and bridges, they make up 5%. 
And if we look at our own ordnance survey from 1840, up there there are castle lines. We have two examples of that. Um, over on the left you have Bride Bridge. And it's, it's a boundary marker. There are three townlands depicted there if you follow the red lines. And uh, the other little piece is a ford. It's a Bailacombe Bale ford. And there you have four townlands marked by the ford. You know, on, on either corner of the ford, if you like. We're looking at the red lines. So that would correspond neatly to the 5% figure here in the Anglo Saxon charters, fords and bridges making up the markers. Um, now, I did refer to the original remit of the Ordnance Survey. It was to map, demarcate the 62,000 townlands of Ireland. 5,000 in Cork, 5,429, but 62,205 in Ireland. And Loud, the smallest country, was covered by 25 maps. 25. And they would be about the size of this table, or the table that the projectors on possibly. Um, so 25 of those would have formed County Loud in the Ordnance Survey. Um, Cork, 153. So that would easily fill the room here, wouldn't it? That's how detailed the Ordnance Survey was that these examples are from. Um, the whole country, uh, 1,906 to map all of Ireland. As I said, housing, rivers, all the detail is on them. And we were lucky that we were one of the last counties mapped. The surveyors started in the north and they moved southwards gradually, publishing it county by county. And 1829 beginning, 1842, they published Cork. And by the time they got down to us, they had decided to include all the field boundaries. That hadn't been done for the northern counties at all. So we got all our fields as they were in 1842 depicted. So it was a, that was a, a bonus for us. But even something as simple as stepping stones are indicated on the Northern Survey maps. Now, what are stepping stones to us? Well, we go for a nice weekend break down there to West Park River, and there's a set of stepping stones at the end of the hotel garden, and it's lovely. But back along, you couldn't build a bridge so easily, so a set of, a set of stepping stones had a real social and economic uh, value to them. Do you know? And I, I was looking through a little book that a West Cork man wrote about his childhood there not so long ago, and he mentioned stepping stones, and he said that if you slipped into the river with one leg, they'd call you a wet leg for the day. Do you know? You'd have kept your leg dry, but you'd have been a wet leg after that. So, you know, that man's lifetime, you know, I suppose so, you know, 30s, 40s, maybe the 50s, you know, stepping stones were still a very big feature in the countryside, and, and our maps will, will show them. So there's the Shawlock River on the way up to Dunmore, and you have this, the stones indicated in, in letters and writing. Um. Now the Ordnance Survey, it really did a lot to copper fasten the townlands as we know them today. Okay? They were working with evolution, or at least to some extent, but they kind of copper fastened the boundaries. And you had a lot of little areas that lost out on townland status, and they, become, they became known as soap denominations. So there's a good example. You have the townland boundary there on the bottom right of the corner. The larger side is uh, Faranesti, that's the name of the townland, and the smaller side is Kulo, that's the name of the townland. But in, in, in italicized writing, you have four or three or four subdenominations. You've Bonard, you've Sluggery, and you've uh, Leglashing. And just off the map, you have Trasherstone, Trasherstone, which you might have heard of. And the, they failed to make it to townland status by the Ordnance Surveyors, so they were relegated to what you call subdenominations. Okay. But you might see those on parish records. If a priest is getting an address of somebody's baptism, the subdenomination might well figure. So, but they didn't make it to townland status. Um, the surveyors came in for a certain amount of criticism that they might have given roughshod over the Irish language. But from the reading I've done, it would tend to indicate the opposite, really, and that they actually took a bit of care over how they rendered um, our townland names. Now, they certainly gave them an anglicised spell. They, they, they did render them in, in, in an anglicised form, but they apparently did pay attention to how people pronounced the localities they lived in as they went from area to area, and they tried to render it as closely as possible to the pronunciation they got. OK, 
Okay, so in, in Limerick, you have a place called okay, Bally Winter Rook. Bally Winter Rook. It's not at all to do with winter, of course. It's the, the place of the Rook people. Um, but Bally Winter Rook, you know, maybe the sound is in there. But I'll give you a few better examples to, in, to illustrate what I'm trying to talk about. Um, so, Gorta Valla, their top left is how it's rendered in the Ordnance Survey. Then you have it in the Irish. And it means the tilled field by the road. Now that's how the surveyors rendered it. But other, others have rendered it as Gortamala, Gortamala, which would give it a totally different meaning, meaning garden of honey. You know? So the surveyors did, were alive to that. And in a scara, not too far away, is spelt with just one N and with a H. And again, I think that would probably match the pronunciation of the local people. In a scara, in a scara, rather than with the two ends that you often see it with. So the surveyors have rendered it with one end and the cage. And I think a, a better example again is Balin Geary. Balin would suggest like Bally, a place of human settlement. Balin Geary, with the surveyors, they rendered it Bale on a Geary, which would much closer match the Irish, the mouth of the place of the rough or walkway terrain. And of course, they took John, John O'Donovan on board. John O'Donovan was reckoned to be the foremost Irish language scholar at the time. And he travelled with the surveyors up and down the country all over, and endured all those bad conditions we were talking about, and in fact, you know, died relatively young. Um, but they, they did pay attention to the Irish language, as far as I can make out anyway. Um, name elements for townlands. Okay, four broad categories. You have topographical, so drum, canuck, cool, uh, clown, carrick, etc. Uh, botanical, uh, cluin, dilla, oak wood, curruck, um, uh, garan, shrubbery or garden. You have land units, gurt, quarter again, park, all those, and places of settlement in Bali, of course, hill, church or wood, uh, doom, liss, and rot, as we know for forts. Um, so just a bit, having a look at one of those there, you could say that, uh, which one of the court we say? So court would imply a field, and uh, if we look at Cork, uh, we have seven court rows, townlands, we have seven courtine rows, and we have eight courtines, along with a lot more courts with different endings. So that's one of the most prolific ones, really. So, look, I'm conscious of time, so we'll pass on. There we have John O'Donovan in the middle, the man I mentioned, and you have, I suppose you could say, his predecessor, Eugene O'Curry, as the kind of foremost Irish scholar of his time. And P.W. Joyce then has also wrote some interesting books dealing with place names. And who else could you look out for? You could look out for Bruno O'Donoghue, who did the place names of West Cork. He had a two or three line description of each townland. Uh, he has West Cork in the title, but it does push up right close to the city, and he'll give you place name derivations. Um, you have, of course, Eamon Langford, who led a fabulous project for many years, uh, Loganamic Corky, and he goes through barony by barony, parish by parish, townland by townland, and there's a whole case of blue spined books in the county library uh, that can be referred to. As far as I know, they haven't made it online yet, but he had a lot of false volunteers working on that project. He solicited all kinds of input from all around the county, and people got right down to field names, got right down to a turn on the road, little spots, wells, everything, uh, place names, place names, place names. So that would be Eamon Langford. Um, another interesting figure is Michael Bowman. Michael, Michael Bowman looked at Duke Hallow in the 1930s. And he got on, up on his bike and he cycled the whole barony. He talked to people up and down everywhere. He gave descriptions of ring forts, standing stones, stone circles, churches, graveyards, castles, even the fields within the townlands. But all concentrated on Duhallow. So if you are interested in Duhallow, his book is worth checking out, Michael Bowman. And among his more colourful examples is a townland called Raskin Street. Mm. Raskin Street in Duhallow. I mean, in the Irish, it is rendered as Shroyd the Gladoira. Shroyd the Gladoira. Literally a road along which rascals were living. 
<laughs> uh, world rascals. Well, anyway, John O'Donovan, when he came upon it back in 1841 or thereabouts, John O'Donovan said it's a decent name. He liked it when he discovered it. And Bowman was a bit more diplomatic. He said the present residents belie the name. <laughs> <laughs> they were quite behaved. And Bowman goes into further detail. He looks at the fields within Rascal Street. Uh, no, that's not it, sorry. And he finds out the following fields in Rascal Street. There's a Quinlock, the stubble field, Parkator, the well field, and in Sheen, a Pledaha. In Sheen, a Pledaha, the little inch of the dispute. And apparently, there was indeed a dispute between the people of Rascal Street and the people of neighbouring Nakanana. And the dispute was settled at the inch. So maybe Bowman was right that the president president belied the name. And another one that Bowman mentions is, is the little townland of concealment. It's an English name, of course, the vast majority of our townland names are Irish. And it's 87 acres and it is nestled nicely in a corner, which is a triple boundary. It's a barony, a parish, and a townland boundary. It's like hidden away. So I don't know if that has anything to do with its name or not, but, uh, but there you go. And you can see the parish of Kilbolahan. We know that better now as Milford. You see, Milford would be the modern Catholic parish. Kilbolahan would be the ancient civil parish. So they're just tucked away like that. Um, you know, the, the Irish language, of course, is beautiful. It gives us fantastic, almost poetic names. You can see some from West Cork on top. Um, Trona Haha is that sounds like it's nearly laughing at us, and that's on Widdy Island. That's on Widdy. Um, Doom, Lis, Wrath, well, they're very common. Uh, Doom is a touch of the monumental, a monumental fort. They all mean fort, of course. So, like the fort of kings, you know, like Doom and Ree, Doom Barry, Doom Warby. Lis, on the other hand, seems to lack the prestige of Doom. Okay? Um, it doesn't appear in the ancient Irish sagas, and it has something more of the everyday about it. Often it's applied to ring forts, of course, the common everyday ring fort in the garden, or sorry, I don't mean that, but in the countryside. And there's 122 Lis place names in Cork, 122 of them. Uh, some are in the Sheen, the little fort. Um, others are extended, and a nice elaborate example is Lichine and Pingina, the, the little fort of the Penny. And uh, it's supposed to take its name from the marsh Pennywort, uh, which is, I suppose, a roughly coin shaped if you look at it. So that told them they can't predate the appearance of pennies throughout the countryside. That's done in West Cork, and Bruno Dunham gives us that origin part. Okay, look, I better, I better wrap up all together by the slides that we got. There's an example of a rat, and this is a this rat people, not too far away, and nicely written in the Blarney Parish Register in Irish. Uh, like quill and kill, rat can be misinterpreted also. So at the bottom there you have rat cool, and that particular rat cool would stem from ray cool, a smooth hill back. It would be nothing to do with forward. And it would have been spelled in 1659 as, as R-E-A-K-U-L-E, -E, which would correspond better to the meaning of the, of the name as well, rather than Rathcoon. And a lot of communities are now marking their townlands, which is nice to see. They're putting up nice stone markers. So White Church actually is an example of that. And Castle Gregory down in uh, Kerry, there's another nice um, set of examples down there. But if you're in a car, it's going to be hard to notice them. If you're on foot or on a bicycle, you might have a chance. But I have to say, I was up around White Church there a couple of weeks ago, and I came across a marker, and I said to myself, am I walking out of Kulon, or am I walking into Kulon? Because <laughs> I was passing the marker, and I wasn't sure if I was leaving or entering the town end. But it's nice to see that pride. And apparently, when postal codes came in in the north of Ireland in the 1970s, um, there was a lot of resistance to them because people felt they were going to do away with townland names and that they weren't happy about that. And I suppose, isn't Mallow sort of a very universal address that we, that, that's used now? It's a lot of posters delivered from Mallow and covers a very large area. So, modern systems can kind of dilute the, the kind of meaning, or, and especially what they mean to people's hearts. 
and, um, and kind of play around with them. But maybe that's just part of the evolution. Um, reading, well I've mentioned some of the place name writers, but for a sense of place, I think Sean O'Fallon is very good, his Irish Journey, and also A Nest of Simple Folk. There are two beautiful books that really bring a sense of place in the Irish countryside to life. So in an Irish journey, he talks about, um, uh, you could say, children, maybe a boy, and what would be important to him in his community. You know, that memory makes us rich as we grow up in a place, an old well, a gateway, um, the cold grey finger of the church breaking the level horizon, a river pool, a turn in the road, things that no traveller notices or wants to notice, but things for which a boy of this region would fight to the last drop of blood and call by the name of Ireland. And then in the nest of simple folk, he raises the memory of his mother. His mother was from Limerick. She remembered the River Deal. She grew up near the River Deal. And the lee at Carrigal Hand reminded of her, her of home. And every year she'd get a sack of potatoes and apples layered in straw sent down from home. And the smell and the whole, all the senses that it would evoke would remind her very much of home. And she, she, she would kind of relate the deal and the Carrigal Hand, and the, uh, the lee and the Carrigal Hand um, together. So, Ophelia of is a real blending of experience, memory, time, and how townlands and parishes and the whole places of our lives, and like the, 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 the kind of stage that we live out our, our, our existence, really, including our emotional existence. So, so, he's quite good at that. And um, that's, that's basically it. I had two slides at the start about the. Um, the redesigning of parishes, which is coming up soon, I think next year. So it just shows, I suppose, that uh, you know, boundaries are subject to change. So there's going to be 16 new families of parishes in Parkland Plus. So Blackpool, Glen, Ballyballand, St. Joseph, St. Vincent, Summer Mayfield, and the Cathedral, they've come under the one umbrella. So, so the Church of Ireland, of course, has been doing that for a long time. Um, like you had in Mascara. Carrigan, Carrigan, they were brought under the, the, union, the <coughs> union of parishes of Carrigan. You know, congregations get smaller, clergymen get fewer, so these changes have to happen. So again, it's like a, it's like evolution. And uh, also, a new book we got in Mayfield Library last week. I was looking through it. Brilliant maps, uh, an atlas for curious minds, and it gives the longest place names in different countries. So there were three that, uh, that I picked out there today. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce them, but you can see the place name pieces. You can see muck, like piggery between two briny places, and drippet, drippet, and little bridge of the tribes claim. So they're supposed to be the longest Irish place names. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where in the country they are. So when I go home, I'll get out to the Ireland sort of entry as well. <laughs> so look, that was just a quick personal uh, trail through Townlands and Parishes and uh, I hope you found it interesting and if you have any questions or any comments, uh, if they remind you of anything, I'd be happy to share it. Um, I'd just like to thank Richard for a very, very interesting talk um, and very, very knowledgeable um, portrayal of what the uh, Chonans are. Now, I was very impressed by all the background information that they had and the quality of his overheads, which was outstanding. And I suppose a good sign of somebody who's in top of the subject is the amount of examples he had for all the, um, the, the aspects of Chonans that uh, he did. So, thanks very much for that, Richard. I certainly enjoyed this event. Uh, I could hear a pin drop when we were talking, which is always a good sign. Um, just one point uh, uh, that's, you know, we all have to add our own top and sort <laughs> to, um, to a, a talk. But <clears throat> I, I was interested there uh, a couple of years ago in the old uh, Breton laws and you know, the Ireland before the Normans and the, and the British came. And um, in, in the books I was reading about that, they mentioned um, the origin of tunnels and uh, particularly 
um, the variation in size of the tunnels and what the reason for that was, uh, which was, was very interesting and very convincing. Now, the point was, at that time, land was rented by the farmers uh, from the kind of an overlord, and obviously somebody uh, rented land had to pay uh, for the use of the land. Now, at that particular time, there was no money. You didn't have currency. Uh, you couldn't actually be charged like 250 euro for that particular piece for a certain amount of time. Now, but they did have things that they exchanged. And the equivalent of, we'd say, uh, a unit of currency at the time was a cow. Now, you can't sort of pay for a ton of and, you know, okay, there's a cow and the rent is three quarters of the cow. So you're going to need to back and change, you know. You can't say that. So what they did to overcome that problem was they created a ton land to a particular value. And ton lands uh, were often called a body of all, uh, or a cow land. And the idea was that the standard rental per year for a body of all was a cow. And uh, therefore, to make every ton land the same value, what they had to do was with the very good land, um, you get you know, a much smaller patch of that. And um, as Richard said, what you notice about the huge tunnels is the quality of the land is very poor. And the small tunnels, uh, the value, um, uh, uh, or the, the small tunnels, the land is very rich, uh, kind of below and so on, whereas the bigger tunnels are the bottom and bottom and so on. So that was a way of it. Um, you know, coming up with a unit of currency that paid for any time. In other words, instead of getting change or having a different price, you had different size tunnels and one unit of currency fits it all. Um, now, I'm sure some people may have some uh, questions for Richard. Uh, anybody got uh, questions? Is it garage and yeah, or shrubbery. Uh, was another oh, word. Grand brother. Grand brother. Yeah, the, the, the gardens, the monks, and the, of the brothers. Yeah. The, 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 uh, it was Trana tra na ha ha. That was a town and then Widdy. I don't know whether it went under all these oil terminals or not. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one? Sally's turn or something like that. 
and to only, to only live for a while, you know, and then disappear at the time. And the Ordnance Survey will show you that often. You know, there, there's a bridge marked on, on the maps down East Cork, and it is um, mm -hmm. on an assassin. So, the, the, the crossing point for the English or something. Mm -hmm. So, it kind of brings history to life very vividly, as if, you know, Anglo Normans crossed the river at that time when they came into the country or something. But, you know, it is the name still there. In fact, the bridge isn't still there because they looked at the area of photography and it's wiped out, but it shows on the early map. There's a place there in Ruby, it's called King Control, and there's just enough space to be carrying the tunnel around, and it's still known as King Control today. Still known as King Control. Sorry, one question. Um, I'm going to ask you about the Ordnance Survey and the
and basically this is the Tone Lens of Cork. And he gives a very good introduction to the Tone Lens of Parishes. I have to admit I drew on that for my presentation as well. Um, it would be widely available, but I'm sure the, the, the county library on the Carrigohan Road they have a copy of the Dickel Show and um, are also a city library as well. But uh, that's a good publication. Well, thanks again, Richard. We, we all enjoy it. It's just a great way of restarting our, um, our society after two and a half years of uh, oh, advice. So, uh, do you want to say a few words before we go to the meeting? We'll be there next Thursday night, the workshop, where everybody that's going to need a bit of help to do research. So, it should be some of the experts here. So, they'll help you. Um, this is a book we've got from when the car was said to you, Footprints of the Town of the Valley of Dan and Man in Black Rock. And he also did it, something a few years ago called Black Rock area, which is available online. And he's putting this online as well to be free. It's not up yet. This is the book he, if so anybody that would have an interest in the Black Rock area or any of that area, the, those townlands, there'd be a lot of information in it. But it'd be available shortly and we'll be sending an old delete to it once he gives it. Yeah. So, well, no, thanks to everybody for turning up and um, thanks again to Richard. I'm sure we all enjoy that. Now we have more than 20 people here, so it's great to see the society kind of starting off again. And uh, of course, Eddie will be keeping in touch as usual with when the next meeting will be on. But there's one uh, on. So, like, next meeting, and we really talk to us and we talk. What are you talking about? What's new and what it can do for you? Say it again. I can't hear you. What's new and what it can do for you? What's new and what it can do for you? It's kind of him, it's just a genealogy, is it? It's on my mood. But he comes all the way from water for no for the meetings. So we will have to go next month for it. Okay, Shanae, Sonny Gubinish, and the Skirmont will be there.